Good afternoon, good morning, depending on wherever you are. Come on in. We're about to get started with our webinar on money secrets for RNs, NPs, and CRNAs. I'm Megan McGuire with Student Loan Planner and SLP Wealth, and I've got Sam and Connor with me. Hey, guys. How are y'all? Hello. I'm doing fine. How are you guys? Doing well. <laughs> Staying well, warm here in Chicago. Ugh, gosh. We had a cold snap here too. It's now 65 in Georgia though. So we're feeling a little better. East coast mm. out here, Philadelphia, we're in their second final winter push, hopefully. <laughs> For yes. those who are here live, uh, feel welcome to drop where you're calling in from uh, in the chat. We can make sure the chat's working or in the Q&A section, either one. So wherever you're from, drop that in the chat. Boston, okay, it's working, great. <laughs> Boston, two Bostons, LA, California. Welcome. Good morning to you guys. Still a little early. Wow. California. Awesome. Well, many people here are eating lunch right now. <laughs> um, yeah, scarfing someone down. Uh, oh, we got a Chicago there. Chicago. Ooh, Hawaii. That's really early. Sweet. Yeah, that's pretty early over there. Thanks for joining. And uh, during this conversation, feel welcome to throw your questions in either the chat or the Q&A section. Connor's going to be our uh, question answer today in the in the chat. We might bring up some of those questions that that come up. Like we we'll might we might talk about those things. Um, we're we're going to talk about quite a bit today. We'll sprinkle in some student loan knowledge, some financial planning knowledge, things that are really going to be relevant to you guys in your uh, particular incomes career situations, job situations. So I'm excited for this conversation today. Uh, my sister is actually a travel nurse, so I did not get a medical bone in my body at all. So that's why I'm here with the numbers. Uh, but my sister is a, a wonderful nurse. She is travel nursing. She's off contract now here, staying with me, thank thankfully. So we've got some sister time for a couple weeks, but she just came back from, uh, we live in Georgia. She just came back from um, oh my gosh, hang on a second. She was in Idaho. She was in Nebraska, um, Omaha, Nebraska. So pretty cool hearing about, well, I like to hear the PG version of her stories. She works in the cardiovascular ICU. So she either sees like really extreme situations or really, uh, sleepy, you know, quiet situations, you know, depending on who she's working with. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> so For real. I like PG stories. That's all me. But um, and then Sam, you work in our team with SLP Wealth for you know helping specifically with nurses, right? Yeah, absolutely. So like uh, even before SLP Wealth, I happen to just be be fortunate to be in an environment where I've had the pleasure of working with lots of nurses. Um, you know, my background is more. I did come from more of like a nonprofit like medical background, but through that, I'm also from Philly, which is a nursing city, right? We have so many <laughs> hospitals here. It's one of our biggest hubs, uh, and I. I've, I've really learned through my experiences that like there it compared to other professions I feel like nurses are pretty underrepresented when it comes to under fan, like having comp comp comprehensive financial planning in a sense right oh yeah for and sure so, and there is I think stuff to optimize there's stuff there's unique pain points there's unique uh strengths and opportunities uh and I think it's it's something that should you know be I think highlighted for sure mm-hmm Yep. Yeah, definitely. And um, we'll talk about some new stuff that's come out too that we can, we can really optimize in the student loan planning space, um, stuff that maybe you're not totally aware of yet. So we'll we'll talk about that, how we can maximize our student loan plan because you, you know, a lot of folks do still have student loans from going to school. So, um, but yeah, let's let's go ahead and jump on into it. So we're going to talk all money secrets. Let's start off with five pain points that they didn't teach you in school, right? Like you guys are smart. Like I know how much my mom or sorry, my sister uh, studied because we were only two years apart. So we went to college for two years out of the four that we were together for undergrad. And I know how much she studied and how much she worked on her degree. Um, so let's talk about some some pain points. I'll turn it over to you, Sam. Yeah, no, I, I like I went to school for economics, but I had a lot of friends that were, in, you know, trying to do the BSN and I never saw them Monday through Friday, I feel like. And maybe I saw like I had to do like a welfare check on the weekend. Right. Um, Gosh. So uh, <laughs> I totally, totally get that there. 
And I think that, you know, kind of the key overlook here is going to be, you know, how student loan planning, too, is very is, is a big piece of being integrated in a general financial plan. Right. They go hand in hand. Um, but we're going to start off with the pain points. Right. You got, we're too busy learning, you know, becoming great at your profession, but they don't teach you about how the solutions or understanding the options for you for student loans after school. Right. Like, you know, they don't present to you the potential pay it off or forgiveness paths and how to measure like which one is going to make sense for you. And I do think, you know, I think something that doesn't get talked about enough is the how irregular shifts and how the long shifts too are going to make it really hard to like build out, like use that extra physical or emotional, mental strength to like build out that budget and plan for expenses and goals when you're off. That's the last thing you're going to want to do on your off day. Right. And then, you know, mm-hmm. we, and I don't want to make light of what the nursing industry in particular went through over the last four years, right? Oh With gosh, all the yeah. ex- being an essential worker. But even before that, the general, especially if you're in a nursing hub city like Philadelphia, there is a lot of opportunity for overtime, but at the same time, potential burnout. And through all, and, and this is, you know, kind of like an overarching theme of all these parts is at the same time is like, how, what am I supposed to be doing to secure future retirement, right? Right, you know, especially if you're under the age of 50, the generations are going to be relying more on individual savings than potentially stuff like social security than any generation before. Right. Um, And so I think it's like kind of making sure like, are you doing enough? Are you optimizing enough? These are big arching questions. And like, I think on the top of the fact that you're working long shifts, trying to potentially raise a family or start a family or do short-term goals, there's all these little things that are factors that I think can really influence, but also potentially derail financial wellness burners. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Yeah, that's a good point. And yeah, I, I think the overtime and the the burnout and the long shifts in general, they're just, they're like a very real thing. It taxes you like physically, emotionally to where like having things kind of set up financially where things are automated or things are just more simple for you, like the better, like the less you have to like really pour yourself into your financial plan, like the better too. So we'll talk about some strategies on how we could do that today too. Um, yeah. let's jump into, <laughs> I like your references here. I feel like some people will, will appreciate these. It was really hard because there's so many great nurses, the history of nurses in this profession, right? Dating all the way back to the 1800s. Um, but just like a couple of steps here, right? How to, to be more organized in general, right? I think it, it, you have to start from like understanding your current financial situation. So, uh, and you'll kind of see some of my notes here. Think of that as my internal or external monologue here. And I know it agrees <laughs> with me with the cash flow. It all, you know, cash flow is where it all starts. And we commonly at SLP Wealth with our clients, or even I think a lot of us came from this kind of perspective before SLP Wealth was really, you have to organize before you can prioritize. And I think that, you know, you, you have to come from a strength of cash flow. Um, and mm-hmm. from there, it's, it, you know, I, I say it here, it's not a sexy process, but it's essential to, you know, building a solid fin- financial foundation. So small, actionable change, change. How are you pushing the dial slowly? It might not seem like you're flying through, but how did you, what change did you make this week or next month that is going to, is helping you and your, whether it's your personal or financial wellness over the next year, right? Mm-hmm. Um, You know, basically- yeah. Yeah, in that sense, you want to break it into like quarters. I was gonna say that's that's kind of what you've done here is like let's take some baby steps, right? Because we're gonna talk about a lot today, but let's take some baby steps. Let's um first do. I think there's a saying like I think more so in our industry where like get the hardest thing, or actually I think in general, like get the hardest thing of your day done first thing in the morning. Have you ever heard that? Yeah, I have heard it, but that's, you know, I feel like that discriminates against people who are not morning people. So right. like, you know, <laughs> like, that could be painful. <laughs> totally agree. Yeah. I, I try to do my so, workout first thing in the morning. Yeah. It, it's it's like everything do, seems easier. Exactly. That's, that's like the premise of it. It's like get the hardest stuff done first, which for folks like starting to build out their financial <laughs> life, like starting to get organized, like the hardest part is just to like lay out the the framework and get organized from the get go because um especially if you recently graduated like this is the first time you're really like managing your own finances probably like it's it's kind of new um or if you've never really sat down and looked at everything from like a bird's eye view like it's overwhelming and so getting that first step like that's also what like delays people for like trying to take hold of their finances right like the first step is kind of the hardest and so it's avoided as long as possible but 
I do think, you know, Q1, we've got a couple weeks left in Q1. I think you guys could do this within the next couple of weeks. Uh, if you're listening in on this, um, take stock in where your financial situation is right now. Take stock, you know, start to list out like what are your liabilities? What are the assets that you have? Um, and then start to put together some ideas on how much you spend. So like you said, Sam, cash flow is is queen. It really is. Like cash flow is the lifeblood of your financial plan. Like it's really hard for you to know how much you can spend or how much you can afford to purchase, you know, for a home or how much you can set away for for retirement or to put towards your student loans. It's hard to know how to answer all those questions or how doable those things are without knowing how much you can commit to those goals. So it's hard. We're going to recognize that and sympathize with you here, but let's get this done and out of the way. Let's list out what our you know expenses are. Maybe start with your fixed expenses. Um, those are the easiest. So like rent, your insurance payments. Uh, there's a lot of stuff that probably comes from your paycheck, which is nice. That's so easy. Um, and then get your variable expenses. List out those variable expenses, which you'll probably want to just get a good average for how much you typically spend. So how much do you typically spend on groceries or going out or whatever? Oh, right? just look at December. Or Yeah. <laughs> December is probably the worst month to look at, right, for holidays. <laughs> look at a couple months. <laughs> Um, but get a good feeling for what your current situation is, and then we can start to build off of that. That's really the goal for Q1. And then based off of kind of how real you are after Q1, right, that's kind of what's going to build into that solid fund. Like, where do you need to focus on, right? Is it kind of, is it potentially getting a better understanding of like how you build a plan for those variable expenses, right? Or is it more like, hey, did you realize that you need to look into something deeper, like a bigger potential problem, or it's actually not as bad as you thought, right? Like now that mm -hmm. you have that, like, like using that next quarter to really focus about how do you, now do I, how do I push it forward, right? It, it can be, um, you know, based off of your values or your priorities in that sense too. Mm -hmm. Leading to the next part is investing in your future in one way or another is the way I take it. So like, don't think of this as black and white, um, whether it's just regular, just investing, right? For retirement, for non-retirement purposes. It could also be investing, uh, and this might actually be like more in yourself internally, right? Like to have, like to, to potentially push you forward in your profession or in the nursing industry, if there's other like credentials or extra um, licensing you wanted in that sense, right? Or continuing education. How can this make you better for your net worth investing, but also, you know, your profession also, turns back into like connects right back into uh investing into the net worth as well mm -hmm. this um, can tie to your goals too like goal setting i think goal setting yeah. is a great thing to do in q1 maybe q2 yeah. as you're yeah. like after you've digested where you're at where you're trying to go like understanding what your goals are for yourself and how money can be the tool to get you there um that can really help make your next steps a lot clearer because if we don't know what we're working towards if we don't know like what's important to us, then that can make like the future a little hazy. Like, what should I be doing? Well, I don't know. What do you want to accomplish? Like, what are you trying, what are you working towards? All right. Um, Car needs so, a steering wheel. Yeah. <laughs> so that, I think that's a big part of like getting right with your goals too. Like, do we want to buy a house in the near future? Do we want to, you know, transition to a travel nurse position? Do we want to, um, I mean, there's a lot of things that could be like your goals that you want to accomplish that you just have to like articulate, put out there in the universe and then start to put together a plan to, to work towards that. And then that could tie into Q4 with maximizing your income potential, right? Like going for the higher certification or going for a different type of job, like, um, maximizing the income potential and then, and putting, putting together a game plan for like putting money where you want it to go. Um, and then you also mentioned like protecting, protecting it. Right. So is that where insurance comes into play? Is that what you actually like, you know, as you're building wealth, we, we talk a lot about how do you protect it? Right. Are you under, are you overinsured, especially specific? And we'll get more into the specific to the nursing profession is there's potential extra considerations you may need to think as opposed to if you were sitting at home as a financial planner. Right. Um, mm -hmm. So I would say, and then also maximize income potential in a different way. Like, because of you guys are some highly trained folk, right? Like, is there other things that you guys could be doing, not necessarily replacing your job, but is there other like uh, expertise that you could lend to, right? That could also help you in maximize your income more or optimize it in theory. Mm -hmm. 
Cool. So let's talk about spending categories. We talked about getting organized. Q1, we're going to be trying to figure out spending, right? And maybe putting together a budget, that cringeworthy word. <laughs> Um, I, yeah, I'm not a, like, so I think budget typically what has that negative connotation, but I actually, you know, call it whatever it is, your spending plan, your money plan, your like the life plan. It's not meant to necessarily put you in, put baby in a corner, right. It's supposed to optimize, um, right. And build and like give a direction that steering wheel that I was referring to. And this, I kind of listed out some kind of, I feel like that's essential, but more, uh, categories built for nurses and you can make these what you are. It's not a black and white. It's personal. Personal finance, very gray, right? But of course, mm -hmm. you got to have your housing and utilities. You got to have those fixed expenses. Uh, and also, if you're considering taking new on new fixed expenses, that should be kind of, that's something you can forecast, right? Like, if you're going to buy a house, depending on where you buy, like, how does that increase your monthly housing costs, right? Does does that mean that is it going to put more pressure on you to have to do more shifts? Or actually, well, in a theory where you're ready to reduce your shifts, can you still maintain this housing cost? So that's a, that's kind of real. That's why I put a note here about getting real about being house poor. Um, yeah. Hard conversations. It is because, yeah, cause I have, I work with some nurses where um, like purchasing a home is a goal and it could mean like a change in the housing payment. And also keep in mind, like renting and, and owning is very different. We, um, we did a webinar on this a couple of weeks ago. You can find it on our YouTube channel, but um owning a home, you're responsible for a lot more financially. Like you are the one fixing problems or things that break or like maintaining the home, which is not the case with renting, which is not to like scare you out of home ownership, but it's like to just be real about like, hey, you need to be real with your money too, to make sure that like you're not going to be accumulating debt by not being prepared for some of these things. Um, but also like I love the idea of doing what's called like I call it a mock cash flow where we kind of have our budget. We know what it is today off of our current expenses and how much we spend now. But then like pretending like we have that future mortgage payment. And I tell folks to practice it, like practice like you have that future mortgage payment and see how it feels. Because if it's going to make things like really stressful for you, where just like you said, Sam, like you're going to have to add additional shifts, you're going to have to really stress, like making sure that you have additional income coming in, like that might not be great for like your mental health. And so you might need to be adjusting your housing budget, which, you know, stinks maybe, but the reality is like it, it your financial health, like your mental health, like they can go hand in hand. And so we have to protect both and we have to be responsible with both. Um, but that's the biggest, uh, that is almost always the biggest, uh, fixed expense in somebody's cash flow is housing. So that decision is big. Like it shouldn't be taken lightly, um, as far as like how much of your budget you're putting towards that, because it really can dictate how much you have to spend on other things. Right. Yeah. Um, so you can kind of going back to the previous side, you have to really want the house too, for the right reasons. Is it aligned? Do you feel like you're trying to aim to buy a house or you have a house because you felt like you had to have a house or you were led to believe you grow up and buy a house or is it you truly want it, which is valid, right? Let's have been that, but build in the plan. Mm -hmm. um, healthcare and insurance, right? And I think this is <laughs> not to be a nerd, but like health is wealth, right? And like you, especially in a job with the physicality of being a nurse, right? You, your, your health is literally your livelihood. And so I think kind of really understand, making sure you're not this is not something to skip on. So when you're evaluating, whether it's evaluating job offers to understand like, hey, what are the benefits that I'm going to get, right? Or am I going to be, is this also going to mean that I need to get additional insurance on top of this to make sure I'm even more protected from like a disability or liability uh, uh, method? So appropriate there. So I think that should be always kind of accounted for at different parts of a career. And also it's once you get it, it doesn't mean you're set for life. Check in on it. Like any, mm -hmm. any it's related to insurance, but any plan, cash flow plan, uh, you know, you're gonna have plan A, plan A, you're gonna implement plan A, plan A goes off the rails, you might need to scrap that and find plan B, right? Like, so that's kind of like, it needs to evolve with you. Um, mm -hmm. Any thoughts yeah. there? Insurance, it, it's like a, not a fun topic, right? Either, mm -hmm. like, it's, it's not fun to talk about having to use your health insurance or, uh, you know, you work with people every day as a nurse that are using their health insurance, and hopefully they've got good insurance for the care that they're getting. Um, but also like disability liability insurance, like those things are important. Like hopefully you never have to use it, right? That's worst case scenario that you have to use those things, but it is catastrophic to your finances if you don't have it, because I like to talk about like disability insurance is an aggressive word, but I also like to call it like paycheck protection. 
Like if you're not able to go into work because you're either sick for an extended period of time or you're injured for an extended period of time, like you're your own ATM. You're spitting out the money that you earn and that you pay bills with. Like if you're not able to earn that paycheck, that is not good, right? Like what would you do if you didn't have a paycheck come in this month? Think about that. So like the in, the the benefits that you have through work and that you can supplement with, you can always purchase like supplemental insurance as well, um, can really protect you against like just bad things. Um, so don't skimp on insurances. It's not a fun topic, but you know, also work with someone if if it's something that you're you're interested in exploring. Like work with someone who knows it very well and who can help recommend the right types of policies. Uh, you can look at working with an insurance broker or a financial planner, and they can help distinguish like what's worth it and what you should invest in and. That way you could set it and forget it, right? And not think about it anymore. <laughs> Absolutely. For a while, at least, until you have to check on it again. <laughs> <laughs> the yes and no. Um, and then, like, most, like, any in any profession, right, emergency fund, too. Right? You know, I call it, for me, it's the shit get real fund. Because, um, like, usually when you have an emergency fund, it should be separate in, in a perfect world from other short-term reserves that you have, like you're kind of just setting it aside and waiting for lightning to strike and hope it never does. Um, <laughs> right. like Hopefully emergency- it's, it's a boring <laughs> account you don't touch. <laughs> and that just earns interest, right? Uh, and But, you know, it depends on the, you know, nursing is a, a very secure profession from like a, an employer standpoint, but at the same time, uh, there's a personal kind of security there where you might need to move on or need to step back or something like that. So that's where I, there's kind of the traditional three to six months worth of expenses, right? Mm-hmm. And that's going to be, whether it's three or five or four or six, it's going to be very personal depending on where you feel like you are in your financial picture. Mm-hmm. Um, yeah. Or between contracts, like that's a gr- another yeah. great example for nurses. Like if you're traveling or you're between contracts, like you're not earning income during that time. So unless you're like picking up shifts, um, that that would be nice to not have to stress about picking up shifts, right? If you're in the in-between. So that emergency fund is super important. And I like your point on professional development, right? Like continuing to push forward towards like higher income opportunities, like moving on your career. And actually it's a lot of it's actually and part of it because sometimes the requiring like the continuing education is not covered by the employer. So making sure that you're setting mm-hmm. s- stuff that you have to do and are required to do is set aside to plan. So you're not surprised by having that kind of like bucket. So even though you might not need it today, for example, like say you, towards the end of the year, you were going to have like, you knew you were going to have like a thousand dollar, maybe $2,000 investment into a certification or continuing education. If you're putting away money towards that all year, that's not something you're paying out front all at once. Right. And that kind of protection. Um, but I do feel like some people might be attacked by this last point, fashionable yet functional workwear. Um, <laughs> so it, I think it could be, especially when you're first starting in nursing, right? You might, you're just trying to get out on your rounds, right? You're trying to make, you're, get to the beds and stuff like that. And I think, um, and that's fine when you're first starting too, but as you start to do get some, and once you do some cash flow analysis and really start to dig into it, actually investing into quality workwear is going to help save money in the long because you're going to be less times where you're going to have to like continue to buy more or it's it's going to get more use. It's going to be more durable. So it's kind of like a short, it's like what we call like a sunk cost almost uh, in a sense, right? Mm-hmm. So. Yeah, these are great. I think for essential, you know, essential things that you should be thinking about and should be incorporated mm-hmm. into the budget. Um, <laughs> Dansko, is that how you pronounce it? Dansko's? So, I believe so. Yeah. I'm terrible at pronunciation, so I was not put on that. Um, I was the person that was going around saying like uh, the Croix, La Croix, like you couldn't figure out how to say the drink. <laughs> like, um, I can't pronounce things either, so yeah, <laughs> I'm with you there. Um, um, cool. Well, let's uh let's pivot a little bit to student loans because student loans are still very relevant. I think in these professions. Um, like a lot of times we do have to be borrowing even for like undergraduate or, or bachelor's uh, degrees. And there's been some new kind of developments lately. I'm sure you've heard about it, especially if you're on, uh, on our newsletter with like the save plan, for example. So I'm going to pause real quick. Let me go back to that. And I'm going to pull up uh, our worksheet that we do with consultations all the time. So we do one-on-one consultations to help people navigate their student loan debt a lot of times this is the first introduction you have to financial planning or finances and it's not fun, right? Like you get that student loan bill in the mail and you're like, ugh, <laughs> I got to pay this back. <laughs> um, 
So let's go off of an example. Let's start kind of clean, kind of simple. And let's pretend like we borrowed the maximum we could in, uh, let's say, uh, undergraduate loans from the federal student loan system, which uh, kind of rounding, we can borrow up to about 30000 in uh, federal student loans for, for a bachelor's degree. Um, and so let's say that that's what we've got. We've got 30000 of federal student loans. Maybe our interest rate, it's it's a little higher right now for federal student loans because interest rates have they've been fluctuating quite a bit. But I'll, I'll go ahead and be conservative and just put like 7% for our interest rate. And let's say we graduated this year, but hey, we're going to be working at a nonprofit hospital, which is very common, right, in our in our nurse, uh, NP, and CRNA spaces where we're working in nonprofit hospitals, right, Sam? Yep. For the most part. Sure. Yeah. So working directly for like the, the 501c3 entity or the government hospital, pretty darn common. So let's say we're we're entertaining PSLF. We've heard about public service loan forgiveness. We want to entertain it. Um, but we've got like a small balance, right? So this, you know, we might be thinking, ah, eh, I don't even know if it's worth it for me to entertain. Let's, you know, let's let's see where the numbers take us. So for PSLF, just a quick recap, uh, PSLF requirements, public service loan forgiveness. It is a program that will forgive your federal student loans if you check one, uh, all four of the following boxes. One is that we have to work full time, which they determine as 30 hours on average a week. So pretty easy definition, about 30 hours a week, just have to be full time. Um, and we have to be at an eligible employer, which is any 501c3 or government entity. So from like a like shift perspective, so if you're at point eight FTE, this would technically, in most cases, will count uh, at least if you're at that. Mm -hmm. And uh, so secondly, we have to have direct loans, right? This is only going to be, PSLF is only going to apply for our federal student loans own, uh, you know, owned and issued by the Department of Education. You might have private student loans if you needed to uh, subsidize what you couldn't have paid for with the limits that you had in undergraduate loans. We'll talk a little bit about that here in a bit, but we'll talk about the federal loans to start. So only the federal loans are going to be applicable for PSLF. Third is we have to be paying our loans on an income-driven repayment plan. So that's IDR plan. And uh, IDR is like the blanket term for all the different income-driven plans. Uh, the cheapest one today, there's kind of two. There's two low-cost low ones. It's called pay-as-you-earn, which also uh, new IBR could be something to consider. They're, they're almost the same. We'll talk a little bit about that here in a second. Um, and then there's SAVE, the new SAVE plan that recently came out that took over for what used to be called repay. So we have to be on an income-driven plan. And then lastly, we have to make 120 monthly payments. So only one payment per month can count. We have to make 120 monthly payments where these three things exist all at the same time. And that's 10 years if you are completely consecutive. And whatever balance is left over is then forgiven. And this so, can be through multiple systems, like if you change hospital systems or if you start to go mm -hmm. from like a like from a hospital to a public clinic, that. It, you're not starting over. It continues forward. Right. So yeah, pretty easy. It's transferable. It's always retroactive as well. So you can always go back and get prior credit. Um, as long as these three things existed at the same time, you can go back and submit credit for getting that time to count. So $30,000, 7% interest rate, starting this now, looking into PSLF. Uh, we don't have any graduate loans in this example. That matters because the new SAVE plan, it's based on 10% of discretionary income, which discretionary income is your gross income minus any pre-tax deductions that you make to retirement, like 403B or uh, 457, you know, any like government type of retirement plan or HSA, health savings account. Those reduce your uh, adjusted gross income. They take that number, subtract the poverty line for your household size. You don't need to know how to do this calculation, but that's what goes into the number crunch. Um, and if we have graduate school loans, the payment is based on 10% of that number. But if we have just undergraduate loans, starting in July, 
the payment is going to be based on 5%. So that's really low. We'll look at the numbers here in a second. But 5% is a pretty low calculation with that high poverty line deduction that the SAVE plan offers. So I put in 0% in this example because we're pretending we don't have grad loans in this example. Let's just say we're single. We're you know, maybe dating somebody but not married yet, whatever. Um, and let's say like our income uh, was 70000 Now, if we want to get a little complicated or like technical with it, like let's say we just graduated or we're about to graduate. Um, maybe we didn't earn a lot of income last year. Maybe we picked up some shifts somewhere. So maybe let's say last year our income was like 20000 But this year, uh, still probably not not a full income year, right? Because we're about to graduate. So maybe this year's income is like, you know, 50000 but next year, we'll have kind of our full, not salary, because y'all are not salary, more hourly, um, but a kind of average salary of $70,000, let us say. So that's kind of the ramp up period. Now, this matters, like thinking about last year's taxes matters, because when you apply for an income-driven plan, it always links back to the most recently filed tax return. Um, or you could submit alternative documentation of income, which is like this year's pay stub. But that could be a planning opportunity, right? Like if you didn't make a lot of money last year, you could base your payment off of that because we have to be on the income-driven plan and it locks it in for 12 months, which is pretty cool. So let's take a look at what that means in payments. There's a ton of numbers on here. Don't worry, we're going to talk about it. <laughs> so um, we've got some options, right? We could just pay the loans off. We could just go and refinance them, get a lower interest rate. The 7% kind of stinks, but maybe we get like, you know, 6% in the private market. And let's say we just want to knock it all out. We want to be done really soon, like five, six years. That payment would be about $580. Is that doable on 70000 of income? Maybe. It probably could, depending on your budget. Um, now, looking at the save plan, though, the one we were just talking about, that 5% of discretionary income for last year's income, that calculation actually shakes out to $0 a month for the first year. And that's because last year's income was below the poverty line deduction. So that is a legitimate payment that you could make, right? You're not actually making it, but it counts towards that public service loan forgiveness program. When we have to update income next year, that payment is $63 a month because it's off of kind of a lower income year again, right? We have a lag between when it's looking at our income because it's always looking at tax returns. And then our more normal payment would be like $140. That's a pretty good payment. 140 a month off of 70,000 of income, very doable. So then that slightly grows just as income might grow over time. And then we we also could entertain these other income driven plans like old IBR or pay or new IBR, but they are going to be more expensive. Really the only benefit I would say and y'all chime in if you think there's something different, but with pay or new IBR um, this plan is also based on 10% of discretionary income, uh, but again, save is based on five if we just have undergraduate loans, so it's half, but it doesn't have as large of a poverty line deduction, but the one benefit is it has a payment cap. So you see that there's a cap here where the payment can't go above $348 a month, but on the save plan, when we do the math, we don't even touch that. So we don't need the cap on the, the pay plan in this example. Save plan is going to be a lot cheaper. And our goal with PSLF is to pay as little as possible to maximize how much we can get forgiven. So let's see what that equates to. <clears throat> so running the, the numbers. Real quick, the payment cap is, yeah. has, has amount to do with your balance. So that's going to be different depending on the, the yes. outstanding. It has nothing to do with undergrad versus grad, just outstanding balance. Yes. Mm-hmm. So then flipping over this next page, and this this calculator, you can actually run these numbers for yourself on our website, studentloanplanner.com. We've got free calculators all over our website that you could use to do the math on what your income situation looks like and what your balance situation looks like. Um, so here in this example, PSLF looks pretty darn attractive. We'd pay about 15, almost $16,000 between now and 2034. And we get our balance forgiven, right? We get the whole balance forgiven. Why this is the case, why the balance hasn't gone down, even though we've paid $15,000, is because our payment is always too low to cover the cost of interest. But the save plan, thankfully, doesn't allow the balance to grow. So we just get the existing balance forgiven. So this is a way you could pay half of what you borrowed 
if you were working in a nonprofit hospital situation, even with a pretty low balance of 30,000, right? Because you might think, you might graduate and think like, eh, I don't even need to entertain that plan. I'll just pay this off aggressively. If you did, you could, but you'd pay more than twice the amount. You, you know, this example here, the standard 10 year plan, this would be if you just like paid it off instead. Um, you'd pay $41,000 if you were capped at that three forty eight dollars a month. So PSLF could be a really good option, but we could do another scenario, but anything y'all want to chime in on there? I want to add that PSLF is not taxable. I, I, I've oh, talked with yeah. a couple of folks who, who asked me that question, like, don't we have to pay taxes once it's forgiven? There are forgiveness programs where that applies, but not PSLF. Mm-hmm. Yeah. So what's a maybe average NP salary, Sam, off the top of your head? Uh, Actually, it's crazy. I actually just had the numbers up too. Um, mm -hmm. I would say it's going to, of course, the, me the median is going to be a little different depending on where yeah, of located, course. but I would, yeah, I would say probably it's going to be median income across all places. It's probably going to be all like 111,000, 112,000. Mm -hmm. Okay. Let's use that. We'll kind of keep the same ramp up. Maybe we had some paid That's work. That's the median, you know. not the average. <laughs> so, uh, got it. But this would be and, some grad school loans too, right? So that's got to get a higher. Yeah. So, and then what would you say, maybe do you have off the top of your head, like an average, like graduate school balance for NPs or just like total student loan balance for NPs? I think I've got one. I would say, actually, I think my, actually my experience, I think it's, it, it is going to be higher than the in, uh, income. Usually it could be in like the 120, 150 range. Yeah. Okay. Both. Yeah. Got it. And so at that point, like if we've got 30,000 of our balance uh, that's undergrad, we're at, oops, let's see, like 25%. So that makes like 75% of our balance graduate school loans, right? Mm -hmm. I think I did the math right. So um, now if we've got a combination of undergraduate loans and grad loans, they give you like a weighted proportion of the 5% payment for the undergrad portion and a 10% calculation for the graduate school loans. So still the payment's going to be a little lower than 10% total. Um, so I've got that plugged in. Let's say the same scenario, like we've, we're starting repayment now, we're working in a nonprofit hospital system. Um, let's take a look at payments. So with NPs, our income is a little higher. So you'll see our payment is a little higher on the save plan. Um, pay plan over here, you know, do we need the cap? Uh, not in this scenario. It doesn't look like we get there. The cap is the standard 10-year payment. That's what it would take to pay the loans off within a 10-year period. So in this case, off of 111000 that's thirteen, almost 1400 a month. So we don't even get there on pay. So we don't really need the pay plan in this case or the new IBR. So save. Start out pretty low, again, with a $0 payment. So like that's a very real scenario if you're just starting out. Like you could have your first year of payment be zero if you're going to be graduating soon. Um, and then 2025, like when we have our partial year of income kick in, it's going to be low. So you could probably bet like if you're doing things from the get-go, you're putting together your student loan plan from the get-go, um, the first two years, the payments are going to be really low, which is great because that gives you a chance to get organize and prioritize your budget for what you want to work towards goal-wise, right? And then later, like we have our regular payment kick in. So like 540 a month, still very doable. It's uh, less than that standard 10-year payment, right? 1400 And then if we're going towards PSLF, man, look at this. We're paying uh, 58000 towards the loans. We're getting about 124000 forgiven. Let's see. It, the balance would not go up. That's a little bit of a, uh, I've got to fix the calculator here. But balance gets forgiven. We do PSLF, so the balance is not taxable. So we walk away paying less than half of what we borrowed. So PSLF is huge for for the these professions, like working in a nonprofit space. Um, and CRNAs, I know the income potential could be a, you know high as well. The balance of your student loan balance could be a lot higher but the, these things still come into play. Yeah. So, um, you know, PSLF is not something to sleep on and can be something, it's a you know, somewhat fixed expense that we have to factor into your budget, but it could be a really uh, reasonable fixed expense as long as we've got the right game plan for your loans. And even if you're not, like, especially if you have those adv advanced degrees, like 
even if you're not on the PSLF path, the other forgive we're not going to spend too much time on the regular forgiveness path, but that does don't necessarily eye out for forgiveness because the higher your debt is relative to your income, still potentially means that there's other forgiveness options out there for you, whether it is save or pay, mm -hmm. but maybe not through the traditional PSLF way. Yeah. Yeah. We could certainly look at like the longer term forgiveness options if if PSLF is not an option. Um, or a payback approach. Like forgiveness sounds great. Like it could work if your income situation or your job situation works out. But I like to tell folks like don't make career decisions based on your loans. Like you make the career decision based on your life, your lifestyle, what you desire, and then the loan plan can follow. Um, and so if we're looking at paying the loans back, that's okay too. Like we were, if that's the case, our income is in a, a strong position to be able to pay those loans off. Like if if the math points to like paying the loans back makes sense, that's a good thing because that means we're making some good income in that case, right? <laughs> so cool. Well, yeah, check out our website for the studentloanplanner.com uh, free calculators that we have online. It could be super helpful. And if you need some help with your like one-on-one -on -one plan, we that's our bread and butter. We could help you with that. Um, let me pull back up our worksheet and we'll get through that. Oops. Anything I missed out on on the student loans or any questions on the student loans that could be helpful to anybody? I haven't seen any questions come through. Um, I would just add if you, you know, let's say you got a bachelor's degree and you had student loans and you went to work for a hospital system and you're thinking, well, you know, maybe I'll go back to school for that next degree. Whatever forgiveness credit you were able to get on your um, existing undergrad loans, that impacts the amount of forgiveness credit you have on your on your loans that you haven't even taken yet. Um, you'll be able to get a weighted average. That's something new that's starting this year. Oh, yeah. That's a great point. So can you elaborate on that a little bit more, Connor? Yeah. So, I mean, let, let's just stick with your existing example, right? Let's say like somebody took out mm -hmm. 30,000 for, for undergrad um, went to get a secondary degree and and took out another 90. So we end up with 120 total. But let's just say there was like a couple of years in between there where they worked for a nonprofit uh, medical system. So that 30,000 in undergrad loans, maybe we have like three or four years of PSLF credit on that. Um, it's 25% of the balance when we finish our secondary degree. And so we get the weighted when, if we consolidate everything together, we get the weighted average, right? We get 25% of the three or four years of credit that we had um, applied to the entire mm -hmm. balance. So basically you finish your degree and you start off with, you know, a year maybe of, uh, of PSLF credit, you know, you're, yeah. you're starting off ahead of the game, right? You're no, not starting I, from zero. Yeah. Not starting from scratch. Mm -hmm. And I will mention too, like time sensitive wise, um, the IDR account adjustment does expire right now from what we understand April 30th. So if you're someone who you're thinking, man, I, that kind of is relevant to me. Like I went to school originally, you know, worked for a couple of years, went back to school. And then, you know, the years I was working before school, though, I was in public service or in general, I was working and I was making payments. Um, like it could make a lot of sense for you to consider consolidation before April 30th. Now, that comes with a lot of disclaimers, right? Like that's not for everybody. Um, you know, it is going to try this at home. If you consolidate, like you just have to, you have to weigh the pros and cons of this, but the benefit to doing a consolidation, which means combining the loans within the federal system. So not refinancing, but consolidating them within the federal system is that you get the highest payment credit uh, that any one of those underlying loans has um, applied to the whole balance. So in that example where you were talking about weighted average, Connor, that's great. Like we'll start out with, you know, one year. But if we're getting the highest payment credit, because let's say we're done with school altogether, um, if we're getting the highest payment credit, in that case, we'd have two years, right? If I'm doing my math right, or like three, depending on how long we were working, like whatever the highest payment count was, we would get that credit, which is pretty big. And that's supposed to expire uh, April 30th. So we have to consolidate by then. I do see a question in the chat. Uh, what if there are two graduate degrees with loans? and worked in nonprofit, but not starting repayment of loan. So that's that's a good question. Um, you won't have any payment history probably from when you were in school because in-school deferment does not count towards PSLF, right? We weren't making payments. Um, 
So if you just went to school back to back, or if you, you know, were in school but weren't making payments during that time, we probably won't have any payment history there. This has to do with if you had like a break, like you went to school, you took a break from school, you worked in public service, and then you came back to school or like you, you, you know, that's what we're talking about here. And Laura, um, you mentioned can... starting repayment too. If you were in COVID forbearance, that counts too. So even if yeah. you haven't made a payment, you may have PSLF credit. Mm -hmm. um, real quick before we dive in, can I, can I put a, there was a question in the Q and A about, yeah. um, somebody asked, can parents working for nonprofits under, and, and who have federal direct parent plus loans also apply for save Oof. or other PSLF eligible plans? Mm-hmm. So the answer is uh, yes, right? But we have to do what's called a double consolidation. So if you've not heard of this yet, this is a process where we force access to the SAVE plan because the SAVE plan, um, or actually, sorry, the Parent PLUS loans naturally do not have access to any income-driven plans. If you consolidate them together just once, then they have access to a plan called ICR, which is based on 20% of discretionary income. So not fun, right? That's 20%. That's double what the save plan would be. So there's this uh, loophole in the student loan system right now until uh, it's going to expire July 2025. So we can do this between now and 2025. Basically, we consolidate uh, a total of three separate times. We basically split some of your loans up, your two parent plus loans up or however many loans you have consolidate them separately into consolidation loans, and then consolidate them together. And then what we've done is we've kind of tricked the system. We haven't consolidated you know, parent plus loans at that point. We consolidated two direct consolidation loans. So that gets kind of technical, but check out our uh, YouTube video on double consolidation. Type that into the search panel for double consolidation student loan planner. It'll pull up a more thorough explanation of this. And if you're working in a nonprofit, this would be huge. So you would really want to get going on doing this. And our team is an expert in getting this exercised or implemented <laughs> exercise. Well, doing the exercise and implementing it. <laughs> so uh, what if we were working in the nonprofit during school and had payments deferred during that time? So that's kind of interesting. Um, so it, it, does this mean with the parent plus loans, you think? Do you think that's the same person? We can probably answer it as both, though, probably. Yeah. What if we're working in a nonprofit school? In school deferment. And had in school deferment. So there's some technicalities here. So if, if they're your own loans, probably not. We're probably not going to get credit. You can uh, enter your PLUS loans if you have graduate PLUS loans into repayment, though, while you're in school. Similar to parent PLUS loans. You can enter your parent plus loans into repayment while your kid is in school and start to get credit. So there are ways of going about it. We just there we have to be care careful about it, but also like strategic about it, right? Mm -hmm. So the answer is yes, but there's a couple like nuanced factors that might warrant like a conversation with us to sniff out like your total situation and put together your plan. Yeah, hundred percent. So, so much more there. <laughs> Yeah, there's we do a whole other like we have we've done many webinars on parent plus loans and then student or, you know this PSLF in general yeah, yeah. It's like, I, like we can answer that question in probably twenty minutes yeah <laughs> no. so let's chat about six strategies that don't really involve student loans to round out like our financial planning conversation and then we could uh, maybe see if we have time for questions towards the end. Sorry, they cut out there for me a second. Sorry for there, uh, but uh, moving on from the, uh So <clears throat> touching on these, like, and these aren't like set in stone six, but these are like things that I feel like really can help just with general financial wellness. Like make sure, like, you don't have to be an expert. You don't have to be like the, like uh, everything's perfect for you, but the, you know, just cross the essential T's, dot your I's, right? Uh, it's something, and it doesn't mean like if you don't have any of these, this is a problem, but it's like, what, what are we working towards? So I think, you know, if, if you have a plan and set to have a solid emergency fund with no consumer debt, like, you know, credit cards, use them, but are you paying them off before they're due, right? That is the key point. Um, and I think when I say, when you see bare minimum, so you want to always make sure, especially if there is a match to get right from your employer, whether it's your 401k or your 403b, get, get your money. That's a part of your salary comp, 
decision, right? When they offer you like, this is what we're going to pay you. That's part of the benefits package. They are betting on you taking advantage of the retirement plan. So if you're not, you're potentially leaving money on the table, but if you don't have a match, right. And it's kind of voluntary, a good, just to kind of cover your basis, a good place to start and increase from can at least three to 5%, right. And that's going to be more personal based off of what you're currently going through. Three buckets strategy for retirement savings. So this is more of a way to diversify. We always talk about diversifying assets, but let's diversify income, right? There's different ways that your income can be taxed. Uh, and like before, and even in retirement, you have your qualified money, your tax deferred money, right? That's going to be pre-tax dollars, usually the default to the 401ks, 403bs, your traditional IRAs. You could have potentially tax-free money from Roth IRAs or Roth 401ks, Roth 403bs. And then if you have regular like non-retirement brokerage accounts, that is potential capital gains uh, taxation, right? In sense, which is taxed differently than ordinary income, such as a, you know, a traditional IRA or 401k. So not saying which one is like, if one of these to be prioritized or the other, but having different buckets allows you different options of when and how you retire too, right? Because I know we were all kind of fed the story that you, you go to work and you work until you're 65 and then you just like sail off into the sunset, right? And that's just life for you. But that's not necessarily how it works out. Some people want to retire earlier. Some people enjoy what they're doing and maybe they want to go to part-time. Maybe some people are just going to continue to consult in retirement and stuff like that. So depending on your goals, having kind of a different strategy of how your income is available to you just can lead to more optimization and flexibility for you. Anything you want to add? Anyone want to add anything to that point? Because I think that's a big one to focus on here for a sec. Yeah. Well, and I would say like the three bucket strategy, like this can maybe be a little overwhelming because you're just thinking like, man, I'm just trying to do the bare minimum right now. Like, where do yeah. I even start to talk about the other two buckets? <laughs> like, <laughs> that's okay. Like, get started somewhere. Like, don't let the decision paralysis get you where like it makes you not do anything. Like, that's not where we want you. We want you to at least be getting the the match, you know, make, making sure we're taking advantage of that employer benefit there because it's it's free money. It's part of your compensation package in a way. You could think about it that way. Yeah. Um, and then start to layer in some of these other strategies mm -hmm. as you start to grow and develop in your financial plan. And sorry, my dog has some things to say about it too. <laughs> <laughs> dog is like retirement <laughs> in the background. No. Um but no, I think it's 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 not necessarily all or nothing, essentially. And I I actually really like that point of like that decision fatigue of like having to do something like whether it's just twenty five dollars a month, right? I think kind of like that power of compounding over time can be a beautiful thing. Um, but that kind of leads you down this kind of not to sound like a broken record of making sure when you're investing in life choices such as like a house or another a big in asset investment like that, are you doing it to the based off of your, you know, the income and the and the goals that you have for yourself um, here with like the be house modest, not house poor. Um, so uh, not necessarily house first, but house modest, something that you're going to enjoy. Uh, you're doing this, it's fruitful. It's providing lifestyle benefits to you, but also is a fruitful asset too, right? In that sense. Um, then we touched on this a lot, cash flow already, right? And I, I, don't, I sound like, you know, it's all about cash flow. <laughs> but I think, you know, when you look at your cash flow, you're kind of essentially committing to a potential spending plan that should be adjusted mm -hmm. for your lifestyle, right? Like we're not, you know, a budget is not meant to be necessarily like a diet where you restrict certain things. Like, you know, your spending plan can be very much based off of your values, right? And build them in, right? Build in that, you know, I have a problematic relationship with DoorDash. That's built into my spending plan because that's important to me during tax season. So like, you know, I, I think uh, like those things, stuff like that, like it's getting that awareness is it can also allow you to make choices that are going to be aligned with what you where you want to go and then work it doesn't happen to happen overnight but are you potentially making that small actual change to work towards the career lifestyle or a potential increase in income that you feel like you want right whether if that's what if, if that's the path you want to go right or how are you potentially investing in yourself every year yeah i think you had I think a, a good slide here too on just like taking care of yourself and like the irregular shifts the long shifts that I think folks in these different professions have do you want to talk on that a little bit and then we'll wrap things up yeah no I think it's like it, especially specific to nursing right it is it, self-care is essential because it is you know your job can be your livelihood your connection there take care of yourself like, you know, make sure building, having a spending plan, you can account for things like sporadic spending on eating out after a long shift or retail therapy after maybe an emotional stressful shift, right? Um, 
you know, if you, whether you have PTO or you don't have it as your benefit offering, use it or find a way. So if you don't have PTO, how are you budgeting or building into your spending account time off away from work when you're not earning money? I think that's essential and something that you can plan ahead for, for a couple months. Um, and then if you yeah, are- we can make it a line item in your budget too. Like if we don't <laughs> yeah. get PTO, like I literally for clients will have a line item in our cash flow or our spending plan that says, you know, X amount per month goes towards vacation. Like that's yes. in our vacation bucket and we're going to use it every year. <laughs> Even if you have PTO, it's actually put that in your bucket. <laughs> so, um, mm -hmm. but if you are someone that is like on like really burnt out, if you're on the press, are you prepared to potentially consider a reduction in work going to more per diem or non-traditional are you thinking about going to travel nursing but you can build a plan that can build in this potential impact of how it's going to shift at least in the short term your financial picture right so you can you don't feel trapped essentially um mm -hmm. i like this so we're a lot we probably have some like i said highly educated highly trained people on this call right and there is a way that you can continue to still be a nurse but maybe there's a way that you can also diversify your income right whether it's helping with research whether it's uh uh Consulting. I actually work with a lot of nurses that still do their job, but they also do some teaching on the side, do some skill training, do actually are working in universities and they really enjoy that. And that actually could be eventually a career transition for them um, to get out of the work field. But I think it's, it's, it is, there is a lot of people out there that do want to pay for your brain. <laughs> and so mm -hmm. I think taking, making, just doing a little bit of research there. Mm -hmm. Yep. Yeah. Awesome. Well, let's round it out. Let's get everybody off to uh, back to work or back to their day. Um, so let's just talk about like how we can help for a second. Um, so student loan planner, of course, we we build and develop custom student loan plans. So that is what you probably know us by. Um, one of the big things that people were asking for is, hey, great, I've got my student loan plan ready to go. Like I've, I'm locked and loaded for it. What's next? What else can you help me with? How can you help me save for retirement? How can you help me start to build out this like life I want to live? And we didn't have an answer for a while. Um, we all did like our own individual planning, but we didn't have like a cohesive like firm. <laughs> you know, we weren't together at that point as one unit. So we did create SLP Wealth. Um, so I'm going to pull this up for a second, this booking link. Um, and if one of you guys can maybe, here, I could do it, throw this in the chat if anybody's interested in working with us. Actually, can one of y'all do that for a second? Mm -hmm. So um, if you haven't done a student loan plan with us, let's get together. Let's put together a game plan to make sure that we're maximizing the savings that you have on your student loans. Um, if you're interested in working with us on an ongoing basis for financial planning, um, of course, we are. We love the student loan piece, but we're also full-blown financial planners. We're highly educated folks in the financial planning space, and we've got a specialized team for nurses, NPs, CRNAs that Sam leads the team for. Um, so we know a lot about like your lifestyle, your income, your like day to day, like some of the thing. Of course, like some of the things we talked about today, some of the pain points that like are specific to you that we can help build into your plan to, to really minimize or to mend um, over time. So if you're interested in working with us for ongoing planning, you get the biggest discount for uh, the consultation for student loans if you haven't worked with us before. So this little form is pretty cool. It'll help you just identify like you know where you need to go if you're trying to just book a student loan consult or if you're trying to book a consult and get together with us for planning. So you just kind of answer the questions, you know, have you ever done a consult with us before? If no, hit no. If you're interested in planning, it's going to take you to a scheduling link and you can, so let me put in nurse or I'll put in CRNA because that was the first. And it's going to take you to a calendar where you can both book the consultation um, for the student loans and, and for onboarding for financial planning. Um so if you have not done a student loan consult with us, um, that's where you're, you'll start with the student loan consultation, and then you'll move on to our onboarding process for financial planning. If you have done a consult with us, awesome. We probably still need to update your plan. So let's just get going on the onboarding for financial planning, and we can update the plan as part of our financial planning process. Uh, we just charge $99 a month for our financial planning. Um, so it'll take you through and walk you through the cost of everything. Um I know we're running short on time. Now, if you're unsure, if you have questions about, hey, like, I've never worked with a planner before. What does this even look like? 
Um, we do offer introduction calls where you could specifically chat with somebody on our team about your questions, about questions or re reservations about moving forward. Um, so I think we've got a link, Sam, that you can drop in the chat too. I think it goes straight to you and a couple other members on the team. Um, so if you have questions about planning or just not sure where to start, that introduction link could be uh, helpful to s schedule a free free introduction. Um, do you have a consultation service for how to maximize retirement? Yeah, that's well. So consultation service, no. Financial planning relationship, yes. So $99 a month, we would help build out your financial plan, help you maximize, um, just really maximize what you're trying to accomplish financially. Um, it's goals driven. So if you're trying to retire in X amount of years with X amount of income, you know, that's what we could start to build out for you and, and talk through like, how soon is that possible? When can we get there? How can we like get there faster? Like, what are some ways that we could do that? Um, yeah. And, and it's a lot like financial planning, like all of us have to do it, right? You're either doing it on your own or you're doing it with a professional. Um, even us, like all of us are doing our own financial planning too, or we have our own financial planners. Um, yeah. so this is our bread and butter and we can help you with this side of things. Uh, just please help us. Like if we're in the hospital or if, if we need your service one day, I know y'all do. <laughs> you know, we can't, we, we can't help save lives or make them better, but we can help save thousands on potential trial and error ideas or potential missed opportunities for just not actually make taking action in a sense. Yeah. Yeah. That's sometimes that's like the biggest thing, like with financial planning, it's like inaction. Like you just, you're kind of paralyzed with not knowing what to do because we don't really have a game plan. And so we don't do anything or we don't do much when there's so many proactive things we could do. Just like we were talking about earlier on the student loan side, like we can proactively be making our payment for the first couple of years, like almost zero a month, which is nuts, right? Like that's pretty crazy, but you wouldn't have known that if you weren't doing the pre-planning for it. And, you know, that's, that's what we strive to do, like find all these little loopholes and savings hacks to help you get to the next, next side and save the most money doing it. Um, so thank you guys for, um, let's see, I do have a question about uh, if I sign up for financial planning, would it include my partner's finances as well? She's a teacher and similar programs might apply. So yes, we just charge for the household. So if you and your partner, um, you know, y'all will probably have different situations with your student loans and jobs, of course, but y'all will be considered one household for both our student loan consultation and for our financial planning. So it's not double the price if it's you two together. But thank you guys for hanging out with us today. Thank you, Sam, for dropping some knowledge and some funnies on us and Connor for filling in some like really technical details on certain topics. I really appreciate you guys. Any closing thoughts? No, no, I'm glad to be, we're glad to be here and I'm excited to talk about this. I love working with nurses. I think they come from like a very interesting background and they are some of the smartest people I know. So like I think, but I think like it is important to make sure that they're aware of the financial planning opportunities out there for themselves. Oh my God, we got a, we got a show from uh, Travis. You want to say hi and bye? <laughs> yeah, I just thought I'd come and see how, how things are going with you guys. <laughs> <laughs> cool. We are closing out right now, but thank you guys for joining us and we'll catch you on the next webinar. Thanks for joining everyone. Thanks guys.